Some of you may remember a gentleman named Herbert W. Armstrong. He's been dead a long time now, but as controversial as he was, he still had a profound effect on the thinking and the theology of a lot of people. When I think of him, a line from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar comes to mind. I had to memorize that in English class in high school. Do, do kids still have to memorize Julius Caesar? No. Too bad. Mark Antony's speech is a classic. But the line I remember, remember is, The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. Now, the reason uh, Mr. Armstrong comes to mind this afternoon was the way he so often returned to Genesis in his sermons. Actually, at the time, I thought it was a little repetitious uh, and sometimes a little boring. H.W.A. was an ad man, though. He was not a theologian, and consequently he didn't think like theologians do. But there was something about Genesis that kept drawing him back there. I'm beginning to find myself doing the same thing, and I hope it's not merely a sign of advancing years. <laughs> It is vital that we get Genesis right. Why? Years ago, when I was in the Navy, I managed to qualify as an expert in riflery. And uh, one of the things they taught us was that any tiny little variation in the position of the muzzle, or the alignment of the rifle at the muzzle, means a huge difference when you get downrange to target. You wouldn't think so. But an inch of variation in where the muzzle is, and you may be shooting your neighbor's target instead of your own. It's that you can really, depending on how far out you're going, uh, you can really miss by a great deal. The same thing is true, frankly, in the Bible. If you don't get the beginning right, sometimes you're going to miss something downrange that you really didn't think about or weren't aware of. It came to mind while I was reading an article in First Things about a Jewish theologian named Michael Wiskogrod. Now, I, I hope I got his pronunciation right. I have no idea how to spell it for sure, uh, but I will put it up on the website. So if you want to look up the article uh, about this, you can do so. It's worth a read, frankly. It's not an easy read, but it is certainly it's a very deep read into Jewish the theology and brought out some things that I had not seen before. The title of the article itself was by Meyer Y. Solovichik, and the title of it was God's First Love which I thought was a fascinating title. Anyway, it got me to read the article, which I might not have otherwise have missed. He said this, The election of the Jewish people is the result of God's falling in love with Abraham and founding a family with him. And out of passionate love for Abraham, God continues to dwell among the Jewish people. Maimonides in Wiskogrod's account deviated from the biblical view to accommodate Aristotle's philosophy. Now, it's not terribly important for us, but uh, it, it's very significant among Jews, the distinction between the line that Maimonides took and a more orthodox line like this theologian would have taken in understanding the relationship with God to Israel. Now, I bridled a little bit at his choice of words here, his imagery of God falling in love with Abraham and uh, like a human being will fall in love with another. And uh, the idea of a passionate love just didn't quite resonate. But nevertheless, as I thought about it, I realized probably what he is doing here is something of a figure of speech. And he's being quoted in another article. If you read it in his own book, he may have pointed out the fact that it was a figure of speech more clearly for you. It's the author's way of underlining, though, the truth of something that the reality of it is, frankly, might well be a little over our heads. We would not quite understand the depth of it, and that's what he's driving at. Now, someone, I forget who, once called Genesis the story of one man's family. I suppose it's been a long, long time since the old radio soap opera, One Man's Family, disappeared from the airwaves, but it was familiar at the time to those of us who heard it. That one man in Genesis is Abraham. And just to underline the point, using Usher's chronology, the time from the creation to the call of Abraham is, uh, I believe, 2008. Now, again, working from Usher's figures, the Bible only has a history, somewhat broken, of 6,000 years. So the Bible effectively 
blows off one-third of recorded history in nothing but 11 chapters. You All the time covered by that book. Only a, a full third of it falls in that first 11 chapters. And it's when you understand what's going on, you go back reading it with this in mind, you realize everything that is written there is for no other reason than to put you in the line of that leads up to and climaxes with a man named Abraham. That's what the story of Genesis is about. And it doesn't, the, the, the uh, occupation with this one idea does not end with Abraham. It continues way beyond him, all the way through the history of Israel, all the way through the prophets, and well into the New Testament as well. And if you don't really grasp the beginning of all this, you may very well miss the point, miss the target altogether. So anyway, uh, the first ten chapters of Genesis are a fast forward to get us the story of Abraham. And the rest of Genesis is the story of that one man's family. And in fact, so is the rest of the Bible. Abraham's bloodline is a scarlet thread that runs right through the entirety of the Bible. You need to know that when you pick it up to read it, because otherwise some things might get lost in the process. Being sure you grasp the foundation is vital to understanding the rest of the story, and it turns out even to have a powerful bearing on Paul and his work. Another reason why, this is, why I'm talking about this this week is because I was buried in Romans the last few days, and when you get into Romans, uh, you begin to see Paul pulling Abraham out of history not just really uh, drawing him out. He, he, to Paul, he is the point. And he goes right to that in Romans and in other places in his epistle. Now, with all this in mind, turn to Genesis chapter 12. This is the time of the call of Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So, Abraham left as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now, he was born in Ur of the Chaldees. And if you've got your old Bible maps in there somewhere, if you have one that shows Ur, you're going to go over to the river Euphrates and go well down toward the gulf on the river Euphrates to find Ur. Haran, on the other hand, is way up the other direction on the Euphrates. I think it's actually in a valley off of Euphrates on a feeder of the Euphrates up there. And there is another town up there called uh, later on, I think his name may have been changed from Haran. Whenever Jacob was sent north to find a wife, this is where he went to find his wife from his father's kinsmen. Well, at some point, he and his family all migrated to the north out of Ur and founded the town of Haran, which is named for Abraham's brother. Some think of this, this, this is the city of Nahor, where Jacob met his wives. Now, the striking thing about the beginning of this story is we are told next to nothing about the first 75 years of Abraham's life. We know where he was born. We know where they migrated to as a family. We know nothing about him personally. And only when we come down to the you know, way down line do we begin to get into Abraham. And you have to ask the question, why at this point would God say, I want you to get up, leave your father's house, go to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. Now, what's going on here? You know, did, did uh, Abram win the lottery or something? Was it just a random choice that God made? I don't think so. I think the relationship between Abraham and God began long before this, that they talked together, that Abraham prayed to him, that Abraham knew and understood what his law was and by and large lived that way. He lived a good, clean, upright life. And he had a relationship with God before this ever happened on this occasion. God didn't just fall into love with Abraham. It grew, that love did, in a relationship. But the love was profound. And what he here bestows upon Abraham is a, a gift to boggle the mind. 
Because he just basically said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Your name will be great. And here we are talking about him all these years later. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left. Now that in itself is interesting. Here you sit with your whole family, extended family all around you up in Haran. Perfectly good place to live. There's water there, city there. There's land there to cultivate. What did he do? God says, get up and leave. He got up and went. Now, I don't think that this happened as a result of the first encounter Abraham ever had with God, that God appeared to him in the night or spoke to him in the night, and he said, oh, you want me to be somewhere else? I'll go. Off he goes without any previous knowledge of this one. I don't think so. I really think that he knew a lot about God and that there was a personal relationship between them before this time. So, having been told nothing of that, we have the suddenness of the beginning of the story, and I think that may be what led Wiskegrod to call it falling in love with Abraham, except that's not what happened. Not here. That love was already there by a long shot before Genesis 12. He did come to love Abraham broadly and intensively. Read it again with that thought in mind and realize that the relationship had been growing between them for decades before this time. Genesis 12, verse 1. Go back to the story. Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And all peoples of the earth shall be blessed through you. So Abraham left, as the Lord commanded him, at the age of 75. And here I stand. I am 75. And I think about asking me to pack up and walk across the Middle East? Uh, Well, of course, they were much more used to walking in those days. But nevertheless, it's something to sober you up. Two big things you must remember as you read this. God already knew this man well enough to make this prophecy, this promise, this statement to him of what he was going to do. Two, Abraham knew God well enough to take him at his word and strike out at age 75 to walk south into Canaan. Those are important things. I don't think God fell in love with Abraham, and I doubt that man thought so either. It's just his way of describing the intensity of the relationship between them. I think the love for Abraham was profound. That had been growing for years at the time the move came. Genesis 12, verse 4. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him. Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. That's interesting, all the people they had acquired. Abraham had a huge household by this time. And the household, this means the guys that handled his cattle, the guys that handled his, you know, his affairs, uh, the, man, the guys that handled the workmen who uh, reaped his crops and pulled the stuff into barns and did whatever it was. He had a, an organization that he took with him when he left Haran and went south into Canaan. He traveled through the land as far as the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to them. From there on, he went on to the east, to the hills of Bethel, pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord again. What's that? Then he set on and continued toward the Negev. The building of altars in different places really was effectively the setting of a landmark, the setting of a boundary, of a, a claim, as it were, like our astronauts planted the American flag on the moon. This was Abraham's flag, God's flag, that he was planting in these locations claiming these locations for God, as it were. Genesis 13. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see, 
I will give to you and your offspring forever. I have a kind of a feeling that as Abraham started out, he did not at all envision the size of the patrimony he was going to inherit. I, you know, he, he put an altar here and he put an altar over there. He claimed all the land in between. He thought, this is good. Well, it was, but it wasn't all. He said, take a look. All the land that you see, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can count the dust, they can count your kids. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land. I am giving it to you. So he moved his tent and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord, another altar at Hebron. Hebron, of course, is an important place in the history of Israel. Reason? It was kind of Abraham's home, but in the end it was where he buried Sarah. It was also where he himself was entombed, in that cave of Machpelah there. And tradition says that the Arabs, they they certainly say, they have built a mosque over the site of that cave. And I've actually been to it uh, many years ago. Walked into the place, we had to take our shoes off to go in, and they have an opening and a grate down through there, and you can actually peer down into the cave, and they keep a light burning in that cave down there uh, in memory of Abraham and Sarah, because they take Abraham to be their father as well. And I think it's, it's, it's fascinating. It, it really, of all the places I think I went in the Middle East, that particular cave held the strongest uh, tug on me as far as its authenticity. And I have a feeling that if anybody ever does go into that cave, they will find human remains in that cave. Now, I'm not so much interested in the history of the time. What I'm interested in is the nature of the relationship between Abraham and God. That's what we're, we're on about now. So we can pass over a lot of the in-between stuff. However, I think I would suggest to you that when you read Genesis sometime, when you come to Abraham and this whole thing, that you take a few minutes as you go along and make yourself an outline of Abraham's life, the major events. If you know the time between them, you make a note of that. Now, you can go look at somebody else's outline in the commentary or back of your Bible or somewhere else, depending on what you've got. But it's not the same as having come off the end of your own pencil, you know, as you put it on a piece of paper, and you outline exactly what followed what in Abraham's life. And the reason it, you, you, I'm recommending it is because the order of some things in his life are important. You really do, if you're going to understand Abraham, and again, remember, we're laying a foundation for the rest of the Bible. It's important to know what actually took place here. Genesis 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. He's still Abram, of course. Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield and great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, or Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household is going to end up being my heir. Why would that happen? Well, Abraham, I think by this time, and certainly he did before he was finished, I think he had a household numbering at least a thousand people. Which means that there's an enormous responsibility for the one who leads those people. And as a consequence, he had to be sure that when he passed from the scene, somebody had to take over that responsibility. And all he could see was a man he trusted very much because he had put him in charge of everything, whose name was Eliezer, who came from Damascus. And the way things looked right then, he was going to end up taking all of this. Then the word of the Lord came to him says, Oh, no, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. Now, mind you, we're well beyond 75 years at this point. Okay? He took him outside and said, Look at the heavens. Go ahead. Stand there. Look. Count the stars. You think you can count them? Go ahead. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him for righteousness. Now, it's important to place this particular statement in the line of the events in Abraham's life, which Paul will make clear when you get down to studying what he has to say about all this. Abraham believed God, and he credited it to him for righteousness. A moment of profound importance that the credit for righteousness, think it, realize this, came from the relationship, not merely from obedience. Do I need to say that again so everybody gets it? 
The credit for righteousness came not merely from obedience. It came because of the relationship that came about from the trust that was there between the two of them. Now, it's a, it's a great blessing to have someone in your life that you trust like that. That what they tell you, you can actually take to the bank. You know, you know it's true. It's going to be true. If they give you their word, they're going to carry it out. That's a tremendous relationship. In my lifetime, I've had a few of those, not that many, but that's what happens here. And apparently, I can only say that for God, that is extremely important, that you trust Him, that you believe Him, that if He says, I'm going to do this, you can add it up in your bank account. It's already there. Okay? Now, this is not to say that credit, that credit of righteousness can come in the face of disobedience, for the disobedience is what? It's a sign of disbelief. So, you know, disobedience doesn't go with belief in God, and so it's not important. But what he is saying is, just because you screw up somewhere down the line, the relationship is not over. I think that is tremendously encouraging and very important to know. This statement is cited by Paul in his long argument to the Jewish Christians at Rome that we've been talking about in the weekend Bible study. Now, what follows on this statement is the actual moment of covenant between God and Abraham. For a covenant to be, you know, finalized or formalized, there has to be some sort of act of formalizing. In this case, he told him to take some animals and separate them into two, two different pieces, and he did, and he put them out and separated them. There's a little pathway down between them. And he, you know, ran the birds off that wanted to fly and land on the, these dead animals. And he waited. And then came down, sun, the sun gown came. And then there was a smoking lamp that came and passed between those parts of animals that had been separated then. And this is the moment, this is the ceremony, which is actually, I think, in many ways commemorated in the Passover. That the moment of when blood has been shed, God himself is present because you don't make a covenant in absentia. He is present and formalizes the covenant with Abraham on this occasion. Then he says this in chapter 17, verse 10. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision. It will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Now, did you notice how late in the relationship circumcision appeared? This is why I say making your own little outline of what, ha what has taken place will be helpful to you in keeping this thing in perspective. And in the whole history of the relationship between God and Abraham, it's this late that circumcision enters the picture. What big event took place before this, historically? The birth of Ishmael. Ishmael was born before this covenant. He was born outside of this covenant. And the circumcision, I don't, you know, I think the Arabs do circumcise their children, but it is not a part of this covenant. I don't know what the circumcision would mean anything. Also, to the descendants of Abraham through Keturah later on. I, I don't think that the, the, the line doesn't go that way. It goes through Isaac, whose mother was Sarah, on down to Isaac's son, and that is the line through which all the males had to be circumcised as a sign of the covenant that they had through Abraham with God, their relationship. And in effect, you know, we sit here today as the great-great-grandchildren of Abraham. And God's interest in us is more than that of a rich uncle. It is, it is as the man who was the closest friend Abraham ever had, the one that Abraham trusted, the one of all the power of all the universe and he looks upon us as the children of his best friend, and still does. And it's amazing. This, this is the argument Paul's trying to make in Romans. And I, I can't, you know, time won't permit me to run down that valley today, but I've done so in a weekend Bible study. If you missed it, I recommend you go back to the section on Romans 9 through 11, which we did uh, for, for this weekend. So, circumcision was for the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and pointless for anyone else. And that point was the deciding factor in the Jerusalem conference in, fifth, in chapter 15 of Acts. That circumcision is pointless for the Gentiles. 
It's a sign of the Israelites. Not, it's not a sign necessarily of who knows God. It's a sign of Abraham's covenant with God. So Gentiles can have a relationship with God, but they don't need to be circumcised. Circumcision is pointless. They can't inherit the land by the laws of inheritance that fell to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants. Genesis 17. God said also, this is verse 15. God said also to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her, and I will surely give you a son by her. Abram fell face down and laughed. He said, Shall a son be born to a man a hundred years old? That's where he was at. And he, he said, Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abram said to God, Oh, if only Ishmael might come under your blessing. After all, he says, Son, he loves the kid. Well, Abraham said that, and God said, Yes, he is, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac, which means laughter. Because Abraham laughed. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. So God also has a sense of humor, which is not, you know, you can sort of see it in this situation. And the relationship between them, as awestruck as Abraham would have been with God, it was very familiar relationship. I mean, he could, he was able to fall down, not only laugh, but fall down laughing when God told him he was going to have a son through Sarah. So there you go. And he didn't get struck. Now, if God had been a different, a lesser kind of God, he might have turned Abraham into roadkill at that point, taken a great fly swatter and put him down. But that's not the way that, that's not the relationship. The relationship is not that. The relationship is of one that can talk to one another. Okay. Now, I recommend that, you're, as I said, in your study of Genesis, you outline all this for yourself because then you will understand the order of events and how important they can become. To me, the most revealing day of this whole story comes in Genesis chapter 18. But before we go there, I want to make an important observation. In our mind's eye, we have a way of creating an image of God that inevitably is at variance from the real thing. We, we, can't, we can't help ourselves, we just do it. You know, we kind of visualize God at His throne. Some people have the idea of God at His console. And that God is sitting in a big alarm chair in heaven with a with his with his remote control and a big tele, widescreen television set, watching what's going on down here and dealing with it. The God of our imagination also may be incorporeal; that is, he is uh, unreal in a manner of speaking. And you can almost write this down: that whatever the image is you carry around in your mind of God, it's it's wrong. It is absolutely wrong because we get it built from a lot of different things that have no bearing on the issue. The big argument that uh, Wiskograd had with Maimonides focused on the latter's adaptation of God to Aristotle and other Greek thinkers. Quote, Maimonides, according to the author, Maimonides also attempted to banish all anthropomorphism from Judaism. I made it. I saved that word uh, without stumbling over it. Anthropomorphism is an interpretation of what is not human or personal in terms of human or personal characteristics. And so Maimonides says, well, we can't have any of that. We can't have nothing that makes God look in any way like man. The objection seems to be that we tend to think of God being like man, and that's really bad. Quote, an entire tradition of Jewish rationalism has followed Maimonides in this and has applied it to the concept of Israel's election. Thus, many German Jewish thinkers, both Orthodox and non-Orthodox, See, Israel's election as symbolic of God's equal love for all humanity. Does God love all humanity equally? Well, this is the argument that's being raised here. Or does he love some people specially? Does he have the relationship with some people specially? The result is a loss of any reason for the election of Israel, a foundational idea of Judaism. The biblical insistence on God's indwelling in the living Jewish people, was, the gentleman observes, requires us to believe that God is present in the physical people of Israel. End quote. Now, while I might differ with his wording about God being present in the uh, physical people of Israel, nevertheless, I think he has a point that should not be dismissed out of hand. 
that the Jewish people to this day are still the great-great-great-great-grandchildren of a man named Abraham who was God's most important friend in the world. And those children are still very special to him. Now, those of you who have children and grandchildren know there are a lot of times when they are less than lovable. There are a lot of times when they go down wrong channels. There are a lot of times when they cause all kinds of problems for you and for themselves and for other people. But they don't stop being your children. And the love doesn't go away just because they have done something wrong. I have one or two friends that have a son in prison. They don't write those boys off. They bend over backwards to go visit them, to write to them, to stay in touch with them, to try to make life a little better for them. And if and when they come out of prison, those people are going to be there for their children just like they always were. And hopefully the relationship can be established at a whole new level. They don't stop loving them because they've gone to jail. I think this is crucial for us to understand. Now, here's the distinction I think it gets missed. It is not that God is like man or that God can be made to be like man. It is that man is like God in that he was made in God's image. So it's not an anthropomorphism for you to say that, that man is like God in that particular way. And it does not, it's not anthropomorphism to see what appear to be human reactions in God. That's not what my, you know, it is, I suppose, what Maimonides was rejecting. But uh, Wiskogrode doesn't reject it. He thinks this is something we need to come to grips with. And it may help us understand how personal the relationship with God and man is. There's a tendency, I, I see it increasingly, I think, sometimes in, in churches and around the world, to think of God's re our relationship with God only in collective terms. In other words, he looks upon us as a, as a church. He looks upon us as a nation. And we relate to God only as a part of this faceless crowd out here. And this is not what we are presented with in the Bible. What we are presented here with is a very personal relationship one man loved above all other men by God. Not that he doesn't love other men, but he doesn't love us all the same. And this is uh, maybe a little difficult to get a hold of, but that's precisely, I think, the truth in the matter and the revelation of this. Now, with all this in mind, <coughs> consider what happened on that fateful day. It's in Genesis 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing there. Now, it seems highly likely to me that Abraham recognized those men immediately, knew precisely who they were. He had no, no guesswork. Maimonides might call this an anthropomorphism. I would not. I think that is precisely the way God presented himself to Abraham on that occasion. Human, in all appearances, outward. A man. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. And he said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. And this is really... You know, kind of hard to get your mind around when you come to understand later that this is God who's going to wash his feet, who's going to actually eat a meal here with real bread and butter and a lamb that was killed and so forth. Oh, yeah. I can easily see they were, they were on their way to Sodom, the God and his two men that were with him, for their reason. We'll come back to that in a moment, but... They were on their way down there, and I can easily see God saying to the two angels with him, saying, let's go by Abraham's place. We can get a good meal there. And, of course, he had other things in mind as well as eating. But nevertheless, God made taste buds. God made food. He made it to where it tastes great. Why wouldn't he not enjoy it? I, you know, came when I was watching uh, the movie Amadeus, it dawned on me as to why God gives gifts to strange men down here on the earth who aren't even religious. 
who can then create music that would in, that just absolutely blow your mind. Because God loves music. It's as simple as that. He gives gifts to men for his own pleasure and takes pleasure from it. So, after whatever short walk they have, these guys had been on, they sat down, they washed their feet in water, they changed whatever they, you know, footwear they had on, they sat at table, or actually reclined at table, I'm sure, he brought them food, and they ate. Now, we know from what follows, one of these was, was Jehovah himself, the other two were angels, the Hebrew word is malach, which means messengers, but in, in the Greek they're angels. So Abraham went into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of fine flour, knead it, and bake some bread. He ran to the herd, selected a choice tender calf, gave it to a servant, hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk, and the calf prepared and set these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under the tree. Now I say, I think, for reasons I explain in the book The Thread, this was in the first month of spring, and that the bread served, because it was so quickly served, was unleavened. You may want to consider the implications of that. So they asked him, well, he said, there in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. I think the NIV misses this because this, it's an idiom that is used here for spring. I will come to you next year at the time of life, which means the time everything's coming to life, which is the spring. And Sarah, however, she was listening. We're, and we're talking about 12 months out now. She was listening at the entrance to the tent behind him. Abraham and Sarah now were already old, well advanced in years. Sarah was past the age of childbearing, and she laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? I, I think the versions miss an idiom here, but we'll let that ride for now. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Saying, Will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for God? I'll return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. The word for appointed time is moed. And that is the word that is used in Leviticus 23, these are the moeds of the Lord, and he lists off the seven holy days throughout the year. I'm going to come back to you at the spring moed next year, which is Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread, and Sarah will have a son. Now, Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. He said, oh, yes, you did. Sarah was a little too old to blush, but I think she had anyway. You didn't, must have managed to blush. Think of the relationship this whole thing describes. This is not what you would think of normally if God comes, to, comes for dinner, you know, and the way you interact with him, it, 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 uh, whatever God says, that's that. You don't laugh, and you don't lie to him for sure, but just like you would if your, you know, your rich uncle came to see you, you'd give him a meal, and you'd sit around and be giving and taking, and he'd say, what are you laughing about? So, I'm not laughing. Oh, yes, you are. I can easily see. This, this relationship, I think, is fascinating. Now, it's a different culture to ours, so the description is at variance, but the relationship is as familiar as a visit of your favorite grandfather. Now, that's just all there is to it. I didn't laugh. Oh, yes, you did. And I expect the visitors had a laugh of their own about this time. Now, when the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked with them along the way to see them on their way, a natural and hospitable thing to do. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. All nations on earth will be blessed through him, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So the Lord will bring about for Abraham everything he promised him. Now, this is really very big. You don't hide from your closest friends the decisions that you're making. You tell them. You don't necessarily to ask them for their advice, and you should always keep that in mind when your friends are telling you their problems. They aren't necessarily telling you this because they want your advice, and your advice may not be very helpful. Who knows? What they are telling you this for is because it's important to them, and they think it will also be important to you because you are close. 
That's what's happening at this place. Now, God has something, I think, a, a little bigger than this in mind. He did not want Abraham or anybody else, when Sodom and Gomorrah burnt up, as they were about to do, to think, oh, what bad luck for those people living down there. He did not want people to be able to say, oh, well, it's just a volcano. Somehow they had built their village on the side of an old volcano and it erupted and ate them all up. That's not what's happening. And so he wanted to share it with somebody who could tell the story, and particularly who would tell it to all his kids, who because of their affection for him, their respect for him, would know what he told them was true. And so he told him. Now, keep that in mind. The Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me, and if not, I will know. Does that fit your image of God? Did he really not know for sure what was going on down there? This is a question asked about the Garden of Eden. And God came back and says, What have you done? You mean he didn't know? Was he pretending? Uh, no, I don't think he was pretending. I think that God graciously went away and left these two beautiful people alone with each other to do what came naturally and didn't hide in the bushes and watch. So consequently, why would we think that it's required of God that he be in the gas chambers at Auschwitz? He wasn't there. I can tell you categorically he was not there. God is not everywhere, and he does not love all people the same. And this is an important thing for us to come to understand. We may have a hard time with it, but there comes a place in, you know, where we have to believe what he tells us, even if we don't quite get it. Okay? So what's going on here? God is in heaven. He is on his throne. He is not in Sodom. He is not standing there day by day. He is not watching on a big screen everything going on in Sodom. God's not like that. He has the power to not see anything he doesn't want to see. To say otherwise is to limit God. However, he had messengers that came and went, the eyes of God that go to and fro in the world and come back and report to him. And he say, say, I don't know how to explain to you how bad things have gotten in Sodom and Gomorrah. Of all the places on the earth, these two pustules have gotten to the place to where they need to be lanced and dealt with because their evil is going to spread all over the place. Now, you're a judge. You're going to have to make a decision on this. Do you trust that decision? Now, even no matter, how, no matter what you think you know, do you trust that decision to hearsay from your most trusted messenger? I don't think so. For you to render a justice, a judgment, like is about to be rendered on Sodom and Gomorrah, you need to be present to make the judgment. And that's precisely what's going on here. When he says, I, the report has reached me. He's not even suggest the report's not true. He's basically telling you, I have to go myself and make my judgment on the spot. This is what a judge must do. He must face the people that he is judging and render his decision in that way. Now, this is what was going on. This All, all this is, is really... Astonishing. The men turned away and walked on toward Sodom, but Abraham re remained standing before the Lord. He approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that live there? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked the same way. You don't do that. <laughs> Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Now, that's really strong stuff. He's not talking to his best friend here. He's talking to God, right? Well, that happens to also be his best friend. But nevertheless, the, the relationship was very close. And Abraham, while he was very respectful of God, was also very bold with God. Now, a lesser God, as I said, might have taken out a big fly swatter and put an end to Abraham right there. You can't talk to me like that. But Abraham knew <clears throat> that God had opened this door. He knew that the relationship was secure. And he knew he had every right, because God had told him this, to ask the question. With my closest friends, I have always known that we could say almost anything to each other without rupturing the relationship. 
The Lord spoke, said, If I find fifty righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham spoke again. Well, now that I've been so bold to speak to the Lord, uh, I'm nothing but dust and ashes. But what if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city because of the absence of only five people? If I find forty-five there, God said, I will not destroy it. Once again, what if only forty are there? He said, for the sake of the forty, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord let me speak. If only thirty can be there. He said, if I don't find thirty, I won't do it. He gets him all the way down to ten. And Abraham didn't, I don't think, felt he needed to go any further. He thought he had made it. He hadn't. And that was Sodom and Gomorrah's loss. When the Lord finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. And I think Abraham felt like probably nothing was going to happen down there. He dropped it. At the risk of repeating myself, I think again we should give thanks every day for the ten righteous people in this country that are keeping the rest of us alive. Because it is because of the presence of a remnant in this nation of ours that we are still prospering in spite of the evil that is growing like a cancer within us day by day. Okay, in Wiskogrod's work, on the other hand, the article continues, Jewish thought begins not with the analysis of who the man of faith is, but with who God is. Not with the, how, how a member of the Jewish people approaches God, but how God approaches the Jewish people, which is, I think, an interesting thing. It isn't that we get up and we make the approach to God. The question is how God approaches us. The Bible's answer, he believes, is obvious. It is the proclamation of biblical faith that God chose this people and loves it as no other under the end of time. The clarity with which he focuses on the central biblical premise of election. God's love for Israel is what makes his work so orthodox as well as so original. For centuries, Jewish thought has attempted to adapt itself to foreign philosophical categories. And it's true. They really have in many cases. And this gentleman's bold return to biblical sources provides a platform upon which to critique even such a revered figure as Maimonides. Not only that, but it makes a connection with what God is it's still doing and in continuing to do, not with all flesh, but with the elect of all nations, which now includes Gentiles. And it is in this particular argument that you can come to understand why it is that Paul, and the argument that Paul is making in Romans, where having dealt with the Jerusalem conference, having slowly come to a full realization of what's going on with the Jews and why so many of them are rejecting the gospel, he comes to realize that God is getting the Jews out of the way, not permanently, but for now, so that the way into the faith and into the family of Abraham is open to Gentiles. Which I suppose the reason why he calls it an adoption, because it is no longer a matter of physical birth. It is a matter of the election of God which has broadened out to a special people. That, I think, is a fascinating thing to come to understand. And it's all of this is of a piece with Paul's argument in Romans. So I'll leave the rest of this to the weekend Bible study because there is quite a bit about it in Romans, the Romans 9, 10, 11 chapters that appear this week. And uh, I probably won't be finished with it either in that uh, line of studies the remainder of Romans and some of other Paul's epistles.